Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio Merlot. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and the Director of the RISE Initiative for the Study of Economics, or RISE. Uh, one of the initiatives we started when we launched RISE was to create this distinguished lecture series. Uh, the purpose of this lecture series is to bring Nobel laureates in economics on campus uh, and really bring together the community, uh, not just of economists, but you know, essentially have everybody on you know, Rice University have the chance of hearing from some of the greatest minds who have shaped uh, the field of economics. Uh, this is actually the eighth lecture in this series, and the series is possible because of a very generous gift from one of our alumni, uh, trustee emeritus Doyle Arnold. Doyle, unfortunately, could not be here with us today, but one of the great innovations that we introduced is that right now we're actually streaming live so that uh, you know, our friends, alumni, and people who cannot be here with us can still you know, enjoy this event uh, while it happens. It is my tremendous pleasure today to introduce the speaker, Professor Chris Sims. Chris is the John J. F. Shetter University Professor of Economics at Princeton University. He received his degree in math from Harvard and also in his PhD in economics from Harvard University. He briefly stayed at Harvard, uh, the common disease known as you don't want to leave the Cambridge area, uh, that many suffer from, especially in the field of economics. But he eventually uh, ventured out of uh, Harvard and actually spent 20 years of his career at the University of Minnesota. And uh, in fact, it is at the University of Minnesota where he did most of his influential work uh, that, that ended up you know, being mentioned in the, uh, you know, the naming for the, for, the Nobel, for the Nobel Prize. Uh, after the University of Minnesota, he was at Yale for 10 years, and then he moved to Princeton in 1999. He's been at Princeton ever since. Chris is the type of person where the list of honors and awards would be too long for us to even start mentioning because we would take you know, a lot of time talking about that. But let me just mention, he served as president of both the Econometric Society and the American Economic Association. He's an elected fellow of the Econometric Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. In 2011, Together with Tom Sargent, who was actually our second spirit, uh, speaker in the, in the RISE lecture, he won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science for their empirical research on cause and effect in the macroeconomy. If I had to summarize what Chris Sims has done for the field of economics, I would characterize him as a Renaissance man who has really made so many different contributions to many fields, in particular, he has many path-breaking contribution in the fields of macroeconomics and econometrics that have defined the frontier in economic science and have also shaped the research agenda of so many scholars. Please join me and welcome Professor Chris Sims. Well, thank you for that um, introduction, Antonio. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Houston, actually, um, and I've been enjoying it so far. Um, I should say about doing my Nobel Prize work at um, Minnesota, it's true that what they awarded me the prize for, causality and macroeconomics, was mostly done at Minnesota. What I'm talking about today relates to my research on fiscal monetary interactions. Uh, the Nobel Prize Committee did not mention this work except in a footnote, <laughs> which said, Sims has worked on this topic. It is, his work is controversial. <laughs> uh, Tom Sargent, they mentioned his work on fiscal policy in the main citation. So you'll know that uh, my work is regarded as controversial, as was the theory of relativity when Einstein won the more. <laughs> um, so this talk is about how to worry about government debt. I'm not going to tell you not to worry about it, but I am going to tell you that um, 
there are a lot of extreme alarmist positions on, in, on both the left and right of our political spectrum. Uh, and it's, I'm, I'm trying to give you a framework for thinking about these issues um, that recognizes the complexities there are uh, and that the simple uh, prescriptions some people try to put forward aren't correct. So first I will talk about some basic principles then uh, mention some of the ways to worry about debt, government debt that aren't right. Um, and at the end, I hope we'll have time to talk about implications for policy in the United States, the European Union, um, and Japan. If you are interested in this topic and want to pursue it, um, I'm trying to make this, this talk for a general audience, even people who aren't economists. Um, the, uh, these two papers, presidential addresses by myself and just this year by Olivier Blanchard um, are for a general audience of economists. Uh, they're not very technical, but they're a little more technical than what I'm talking, than, what, than my talk today will be. And there's actually a deep literature of um, quite technical papers on the inter interaction of monetary and fiscal policy and the connection of fiscal policy to inflation. If you re really want to get deeply into this, and you could find that by following references in these um, three, paper, three, three things I met, mentioned, my presidential address, Blanchard's, and uh, John Cochran of Stanford's, uh, dra he's got a whole book on this topic um, that uh, he's posted on the internet in draft form. <clears throat> um, those of you who are economists who have thought about this and know a little bit about this literature will know that as I go through here, because I'm trying to make it understandable, I'm skipping over some technical details and, con and questions. And um, it's perfectly legitimate to call me in to account for these things in the question and answer period. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's head into it now. Here are, here's part one, uh, a few basic principles. Um, the first point that, that's something that's been understood in the economics literature for quite a while, which is that tax smoothing makes sense. Now, what do I mean by tax smoothing? Ta taxes cause loss of efficiency, sometimes called dead weight loss in the literature. They distort economic decisions. So when you have to tax a lot, you have to tax income, you have to tax you have excise taxes, consumption taxes. They all make people change the way people make decisions and generally in a, in a direction that makes things less efficient, creates less um, a smaller pie for everybody. So we don't like high taxes. However, the distortions from taxes get worse more than linearly as tax rates go up. If tax rates are very small, the degree to which they affect people's decisions is very small and the losses from that are very small. As tax rates go up, the losses from the, from the high taxes uh, get bigger. And um, it turns out that if you have to finance um, a given amount of expenditures, it, you get less loss from the tax distortions if you can keep the taxes nearly constant. Taxing a lot now to get debt down so you can make taxes lower in the future turns out not to be a good trade-off. You're better, you're better off taxing at a stable level. You reduce the total amount of distortion if you can keep taxes uh, stable. And that means keeping, generally keeping debt stable or slowly decreasing over time rather than reducing the debt as rapidly as possible. There are a lot of different models um, in the literature that have explored this but it's a, it's a very general result that um, to a first approximation, the optimal way to deal with a sudden increase in the need for government expenditure that's temporary 
is not to tax now to cover that temporary increase in expenditure, but to tax to do some increase in taxes, issue some debt, and keep the amount of taxes stable after that. <clears throat> so that's the first principle. It's a good idea to this is what this is the efficient use of government debt as a way to smooth taxes. You you retire government debt when uh, when the economy is booming, and you um, increase government debt when there's when the economy is uh, in recession, and you need to do unemployment compensation and stimulate the economy. Also, during wartime, we see this a clear example that this that um, of this principle. Generally, um, wartime expenditures are very high. They're generally financed both by higher taxes and by issuing a lot of debt, and that has the, the um, desired effect of shifting part of the tax burden later in time and keeping the tax um, burden slow. Second point is that government debt is backed by primary surpluses. So what's a primary surplus? A primary surplus is government revenues, less government expenditures, other than interest. So it is the amount of revenues that are going to the holders of government debt. They're going to the holders of government debt either as interest or as net retirements of debt. <clears throat> um, it's, it, you can think of it as the primary surplus as the flow of returns to holders of government debt. The market value of government debt in a world where people are, are forward-looking and have expectations about future primary surpluses, the market value of government debt is the discounted present value of these future primary surpluses. This is the same principle the same logic, the same mathematics that says the price of equity in Microsoft is the discounted present value of expected future dividends or cash flows for, for uh, Microsoft Corporation. Um, this is almost just an identity. <clears throat> um, so um, that has the implication that when there's an imbalance between the amount of debt outstanding and expected future primary surpluses. And the debt is nominal debt, meaning it's debt denominated in the, local, the currency of the country that's issuing the debt. Um, the, the imbalance will affect inflation. So if a government runs this year a big deficit and increases debt by a lot, and if at the same time the public or markets don't expect that there's any future increase in primary surpluses, that is increased taxation or reduced expenditure to back up that increased debt, then you have this, this debt that people can see is not worth as much as it is at the current price level. People try to get rid of it. They spend. That's going to push up demand and push up prices until the real value of the debt gets down to a level that corresponds to the expected future primary surpluses that back it up. <clears throat> so uh, when we, you think about the connection between inflation and government debt, it's not a, a, a unidirectional causal connection. It's an equilibrium relationship. So you can think of the government expanding government debt and not increasing future primary surpluses. That's going to be inflationary. But you can also get the reverse happening. You can have people believing that there are going to be high primary surpluses in the future, and the government is now contracting, retiring government debt. That's going to be deflationary. It's going to make people feel that the amount of debt out there is worth more than its, current, than its value at the current price level, that'll push prices down. It'll reduce demand, 
push prices down or push the rate of inflation down until the um, people feel that, they, that the debt matches the future primary surpluses. And the causality can go in the other direction. You can have a policy change or a shift in the political winds that make people believe that the primary surpluses are going, are going to be different in the future, even though nothing has happened to the debt just now. People decide, people have the view that primary surpluses are going to be higher, there's going to be more austerity in the future, that can cause deflation right now. It, already, it makes the real value, the, the equilibrium value of the real debt higher, makes people desire to hold more of it. And you can make policy errors in any direction here. You can make a policy error by convincing people that government debt uh, is valuable or of increased value at a time when you need to be stimulating the economy because you're in recession and that you can generate, um, you can generate contraction by making government debt too attractive. And of course, you can do the opposite. You can um, make people dis believe that, that fiscal policy is out of control. Future primary surpluses are going to be lower than was expected. Um, inflation starts to rise, and you can get an inflationary spiral. <clears throat> so this slide I've actually almost gone through. Our deficits inflationary. You can't say that a deficit is inflationary without knowing what it does to what the, the deficit does to expected future primary surpluses. A natural guess might be that when a big deficit occurs, sensible people would think that makes it more likely there are going to be big deficits in the future, smaller primary surpluses. If that's so, deficits are inflationary. Deficit occurs, people think not only is debt going up now, there's going to be fewer, lower primary surpluses in the future. The debt, the paper that's being issued is not being backed by future primary surpluses. People will want to get rid of it, they'll try to spend, inflation will go up. Um, however, standard macroeconomic models for the last several decades <coughs> have made an assumption that's sometimes called Ricardian fiscal policy or passive fiscal policy that postulates that when deficits go up, expected future primary surpluses go up by just the amount necessary to make this increase in deficits non-inflationary. Um, there's, no, there's little to no empirical uh, evidence that this is the way people actually behave. Um, and you might think, why would somebody, why would the public think that when the deficit occurs today, this makes it likely that, that taxes will, will go up or expenditures will be cut um, in the future? You, you might think that at first, but experience in Japan and Europe and up until recently the U.S., um, tells us that actually it could go the other way. It could be that an aging population that's very worried about its future medical care, its future pensions, very aware of the fact that their legislature and, politi and the politicians in power aren't doing anything systematic to prepare for the big demands on fiscal revenues that are going to come as the population ages. For people thinking like that, news that the government has run yet another big deficit, especially if it occurs not as a reaction to a recession, but simply out of the blue as a, as a big deficit at a time when, when we're otherwise prosperous, people might look at that and think, that means that the fiscal system is um, not functioning properly, that people aren't making, making rational decisions, and something terrible may happen in the future. Not only that 
that, and the problem is if people are thinking that way, it's not just that they have an expectation that their, that their social security will be 20% lower or that they will ha be paying 20% more for medical care. People don't know who's going to be hit. They know that there's going to have to be some adjustment. Will it be in social security and Medicare or will it be higher taxes on the rich? Who knows? And if you're an individual, this uncertainty makes a given amount of needed future primary surpluses more threatening to you as, uh, as, as a consumer. So I think it's plausible that, that um, we might have what, what you could call hyper-Ricardian expectations, where deficits are not only not, not inflationary, but the right kind of deficit can be deflationary. It can, it can make people pessimistic about future fiscal policy in the sense that they think that there will be higher taxes or lower spending in the future, uh, and at the same time, increase their uncertainty about exactly how that's going to work out. <clears throat> now, I've been talking about um, inflation and debt as if debt determines inflation. But most people think monetary policy determines inflation. The Fed determines inflation. Um, the Fed raises interest rates. That depresses the economy and pushes, pushes inflation down. The Fed reduces interest rates. It, it stimulates the economy, push, pushes inflation up. <clears throat> what does this have to do with fiscal policy and debt? Um, so when the Fed raises interest rates, if it does reduce inflation, how is that working through what I've said is this balance between uh, debt and expected future primary uh, surpluses. The, uh, from what I've said, you'd think, and it's true, in order for the re interest rate rise on the part of the Fed to produce downward pressure on prices, it must induce people to believe that the future primary surpluses will be greater. How does that work? Why is that even plausible? We don't talk, certainly Congress doesn't respond to an interest rate rise by saying, on the part of the Fed, by saying, oh, the Fed is tightened, we have to increase taxes or we have to cut spending. Um, but um, what happens is the interest rate rise increases the interest expense component of the budget. The ordinary deficit doesn't, unlike the primary surplus or deficit, doesn't subtract out the interest rate. When the interest expense component of the budget goes up, that's an increased deficit. Um, so when the deficit increases, when the, when the interest expense, when the deficit, in, when the interest rate goes up and the interest expense component of the budget goes up, that doesn't change the primary surplus because the primary surplus has the interest expense taken out. But it changes the deficit or the primary, the primary deficit or surplus. It makes the primary surplus smaller. <clears throat> um, no, it, it leaves the primary surplus unchanged. It makes the conventional deficit go up. Um, ordinarily, Congress does react to some extent to fluctuations in the deficit. So if the deficit goes up and Congress reacts by even somewhat contracting expenditures or increasing taxes, that raises the primary surplus. That generates the response and fiscal policy that's required for monetary policy to have an effect on the price level. <clears throat> now, it's po of course perfectly possible to have a legislature that pays no attention to the deficit the conventional deficit at all and doesn't change its expenditure or its tax plans at all. And there have been countries and times where this has been exactly the way it worked. In the 1980s in Brazil, um, inflation was very high, interest rates were very high, the political system was dysfunctional, the central bank 
interest expense as a proportion of the budget was already a huge proportion of the budget. So the, the central bank's thinking about, well, the interest rate is 20% now. To get ahead of inflation, we've got to make it 27 30%. But then they think, what's going to happen? The legislature's not going to do anything except pass this interest rate, interest expense through in an increased rate of issuance of debt. So the higher they raise the interest rate, the faster the debt grows. And in that situation, raising the interest rate does not restrain inflation. So it's quite possible to have a configuration of monetary and fiscal policy in which monetary policy loses control of the inflation rate because of this failure of legislatures to react to um, what's happening um, in monetary policy. <clears throat> so what are some wrong ways to think about government debt? One way that you see some discussion of in policy circles is the notion that there is some critical ratio of debt to GDP, and if we cross that threshold, bad things will happen. <clears throat> um, there's a book by uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff that studies historical patterns of debt in many countries um, and argues that for poor countries or medium poor countries, a threshold of something like 30 percent of GDP is critical and once you go over that, you begin to get uh, very high inflation. Of course, we're now in the U.S. at approximately 100 percent of GDP. It depends on how you count the debt held by the Fed, um, which we can talk about in Q&A if you want to. Um, the, um, but it's way over this level that Reinhardt and Rogoff think of as critical for developing countries. Um, and I'd argue that we're not actually at the edge of some cliff with the level of GDP, the GDP uh, to debt ratio we have now. Um, imagine that our debt doubled from its current level of close to 100 percent to what's actually the present level in Japan, about 200 percent. Um, would this be a fiscal, fiscally unsustainable situation? Not really. At a real net of inflation interest rate of 3 percent, which is actually higher than the real interest rate net of inflation has been uh, in recent history. An additional 100 percent of GDP as debt would require for debt service to keep the debt from growing about 3 percent of GDP in more revenue or reduced expenditures. <clears throat> that um, revenues now are on the order of a little less than 20 percent of GDP, federal revenues. So they would have to increase by about 15 percent to cover this additional debt. That's not a trivial increase, but it's not at all unfeasible. Um, many countries have higher rates of taxation. Many rich countries have higher rates of taxation than the U.S. does. Um, we could, we could, it would be quite feasible, apart from the politics, to get uh, our tax take high enough to cover an additional 100 percent of GDP in debt if we need it. It's not like if our debt goes to 120 percent of GDP, we're going to suddenly hit some trigger where, where terrible things happen. <clears throat> um, one way people uh, talk about this kind of a threshold is the notion there could be something like a run on government debt, the way there is a run, there can be a run on a bank. Um, now, there is a threshold for a run. Um, an interesting thing about, about recognizing the important difference between nominal debt denominated in your own currency and debt denominated in some other currency, like members of the EU issue or like Ecuador and Panama, which are dollarized economies issue, they issue dollar debt. The European Union countries issue euro debt, and they can't print euros. 
For a country like the US or Japan or the UK that issues debt in its own currency, so long as expected future primary surpluses are positive, discounted, the debt has positive value. You can have people who, if people decide that the primary surpluses are likely to be lower than they thought, they will think that the current and the price le before the price level changes, people will be uh, trying to get rid of their debt, trade it for other things. This will push up the price level, bring the value of the market value of the debt down, but it won't produce a run. It's, a run is a situation where the first people to sell come out all right and the laggers are left with nothing. That's what happens at a bank when everybody tries to deposit their, uh, withdraw their deposits at once. But for a country that issues nominal debt, what happens if pe people lose confidence in the level of future primary surplus is a decline in the value of the debt that uh, is likely to come about through inflation. <clears throat> For countries like the EU, countries in the EU, or Ecuador and Panama, or uh, uh, many countries back in the era of the gold standard, the debt they issued was not denominated in something they could print. And then the critical threshold is that primary surpluses um, discounted to the present must match the value of the debt in gold or dollars or euros. And so even though you have positive expected primary surpluses, if suddenly people decide that they are actually only going to be 20, worth 20% 20 less than what, what they had been thinking, in the US or the UK, that forces a 20% devaluation in the debt, a 20% inflation over some span of time. In a euro area country or or uh, Ecuador, it's going to produce default because there's no way, if you can't generate the primary surpluses, you can't roll over the debt when it comes due. Um, so those countries have much uh, more stringent uh, fiscal requirements. They have less of an ability to use debt as a cushion against um, adverse fiscal events than do countries like the US, UK, and Japan. In fact, some, including me, would argue that it was that failure to recognize what was being given up in this way by the EU when they formed, by the Euro area, um, has been the major flaw that's still threatening the future of the Euro area. They, they basically ignored the fact that they were giving up a very important fiscal cushion in forcing all countries to issue debt in euros and having no central fiscal authority that could issue bonds in euros. Um, so um, after having heard all this, you might ask, does the US, with its current fiscal policies, risk shaking confidence in its ability to produce primary surpluses. Now, as I've said, this is, if it shakes confidence, this is not likely to produce default, but it could produce inflation. This is a plot of the U.S. federal primary surplus <laughs> as a fraction of the market value of debt. So this is the return, the percentage return to holders of debt. It ought to average about the real rate of return, uh, maybe plus, less a little bit of a discount for the convenience of holding government debt rather than some other less liquid asset, should be, should be positive on average. If you go back before the mid-70s, it was positive on, on average. It went negative in recessions, and then it came back. <clears throat> this huge decline in 1975, you can see that big dip. <clears throat> that was President Ford's initiative to um, counteract a recession, which was actually almost over by, by the time this, this stimulus ta tax cut went into effect. And for several years thereafter, 
the government ran primary deficits. I think it was particularly important for the political economy. This was after Nixon had famously said, we're all Keynesians now. Uh, the, the Republican Party, which had and actually to some extent still has, maybe, that, maybe I should say after 2016, that maybe not really holding anymore, uh, the <laughs> reputation of being concerned about fiscal stability and deficits, um, they produced the biggest primary deficit as a percentage of debt outstanding that we've seen even since. Um, the debt was smaller then, of course, but um, it was a drastic cut in the return to holders of government debt that lasted for several years. Um, and I would think, I'd argue that, that the effect on uh, bond market participants was long lasting. It showed that, that you couldn't, this pattern that we'd seen up to about 1970 in which there was usually a primary surplus and just occasional brief deviations from that, we saw sustained deviations from primary surpluses. Um, and we didn't really get anything that, co that co counterbalanced those big primary surpluses <clears throat> until um, the Clinton administration where through luck or policy primary surpluses went up and stayed up and the debt plummeted um, creating um, a political um, windfall for congressmen who thought well you, it, you may recall that at the time of the beginning of the Bush administration, Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Fed, was discussing how would monetary policy ever proceed if U.S. government debt went to zero. Um, and there was lots of hemming and hawing about whether this, this was a, a serious problem or not. It was a reason we shouldn't let the debt go to zero. Well, it never got to zero because uh, politicians realize why should we ever let it go to zero. Um, and then, <laughs> then of course, in the Great Recession in 2008-9, we got a big primary deficit. It was a primary deficit that, relative to the size of the recession, was not unusual. If you looked at what happens to government expenditures and revenues in recessions and applied the same coefficients, to this very big recession, you get a corresponding decline in uh, primary surpluses. What's disturbing is that previously, whenever it's dipped below the horizontal zero axis line, within at least a small number of years, it's come back and gone above. We're still below. And not only that, it's bending down again. Uh, this only goes through, uh, I think, 2017. It doesn't have last year and the beginning of this year in it. And I think that last uh, edge at the at the right of the graph is going down uh, further, which we which is something we haven't seen before in times of prosperity. So um, if that persists, then it could be a, it could be a problem for uh, the Fed and for uh, monetary policy. <clears throat> Now here, the question is then, why are, why is, are, are markets so calm? Uh, this is a plot of what's called the break-even in, inflation rate. It's the difference in interest rates on inflation-protected treasury securities and uh, ordinary nominal treasury securities. Um, and it's uh, at this inflation rate, the two yield the same amount. So in, it's a measure of expectations. It's now right just below, just above two, well, on this graph, it looks just above 2%. I checked yesterday. I haven't redone the graph. It's now just below 2%. 2% is the inflation target of the Fed. It says that markets are not particularly worried about inflation right now, at least in the immediate future. Um, so why might it be that, that people in markets are staying so calm in the presence of primary surpluses that seem to be so persistent. 
It could be because of the pattern in this graph. This is federal interest expense as a fraction of total expense, uh, expenses. Um, and recently it's been on the order of 10% to 12%. Back in the 50s, it was on the same amount, 10% to 12%. Uh, in the 60s, it got up to 10 or 15%. It shot up in the early 80s with Volcker's raising the interest rate. Remember, raising interest rates, um, uh, of course, at a given level of debt, increases interest expense, and Volcker raised interest rates a lot and kept them up. So um, federal interest expense went way up and stayed up for um, a decade or two. And in that time, Congress tried to reform itself, created rules which are still nominally in effect, but not, not actually very biting anymore. They created rules whereby if you proposed an expenditure, you were supposed to explain how you were going to pay for it. If you proposed a tax cut, you had to say what expenditure you were going to cut. And that helped discipline budget discussions. Um, and that and the, the good luck or good policy of the Clinton administration uh, brought the interest expense back down. Now, why is interest expense so low now when we have this huge debt? Well, the reason is that interest rates are at historic lows. Um, we don't understand exactly why interest rates have been so persistently low for so long. A lot of people assume, the Fed up until recently was assuming that we would before long get back up to normal interest rates of 3% or 4%. Um, and if we did, because the debt is so much bigger now, if we move back up to 4 or 5% interest rates, interest expenses, a component of the budget, would go above what it hit at the peak back here. Um, and you can suppose that people think that despite the lack of attention to fiscal soundness on the part of um, the, uh, the legislature now, if once they see that the pie they have to divide up is getting eaten up by interest expense, and they recognize the dynamics, that if they just let the interest expense pass through to increase debt, it's going to make the interest expense grow and grow very rapidly. Once they see that, it may, uh, it did in the past result in increased fiscal discipline, and it could happen again. Of course, we, we have a different political environment now, so we have to keep our fingers crossed. Um, so, um, people talk about debt as a burden on future generations. Um, there is a sense in which this is true, but it depends, for one thing, on the time scale. Sometimes people say, well, debt really isn't a burden because we owe it to ourselves. Um, we postpone taxation by issuing debt, but then to retire it, we're, having to, we're gonna raise taxation the same. If, if those two things occur closer and not close enough together in time, then the cohort of people who are avoiding some taxation by the debt issue is the same bunch of people mainly who are going to be paying increased taxes a little later. But, if you, but a permanent increase in debt that's not retired, that's uh, not a part of the cyclical pattern of recession debt increases and then recovery debt de decreases, um, that such a permanent increase in the debt does burden future generations. Um, the, uh, the debt has to be serviced if it's not going to grow indefinitely. And, um, and so the, the, the burden on the future generations is this steady flow of debt service that they're going to have to pay. Sometimes people say, well, look, per capita debt is around $67,000 per person. Um, if you think of that as like student loan debt that your kid has to pay off uh, within a finite time during their working life, it sounds terrible, but they don't. This is a debt that can be postponed 
um, can be smoothed out over time. So the burden, there is a burden there, but it's more on the order of one, and, one to one and a half thousand dollars per year on everybody forever um, for at the current level of debt. So I'm, it's not that I don't want to, want to say that debt is not a burden on future generations, but it's possible to quote figures on the debt that make it sound more alarming uh, than it is. So here are some more mistaken ways to think about the debt. Um, there's a famous line from Vice President Cheney uh, uh, that was quoted in, in the um, memoirs of his Treasury Secretary uh, that Reagan taught us deficits don't matter. Um, and there are people on the right in the Republican Party who actually have this view. It looks like maybe it's reflected in the big tax cut and big deficits that we've had recently. How do people get this idea? Some people talk with this, about debt with the simple idea that is just like personal debt, uh, that, that you must pay it off or you'll go to jail or something like that. Um, but um, so how do, how do people get the idea that there's no problem at all with issuing large amounts of debt? I think some, one reason that this view becomes popular or widespread is that uh, economists have uh, pushed too hard on explaining to people how valuable it is to have an independent central bank. The idea is there is a central bank that's in charge of controlling inflation. The danger of uh, that, that the, the threat to inflation, to control of inflation is that the fiscal authorities may try to push the central bank around and make them buy a lot of government debt so the government can issue lots of debt and cause inflation. And so, for example, in the set, institutional setup of the euro area, they really tried to completely cut off fiscal communication between the fiscal authorities and the central bank. The idea is the central bank is doing inflation control. It's supposed to not talk to people doing fiscal policy. In fact, there's nobody to talk to, or rather there's 17 finance ministers to talk to. And so there's, there's, there can't be anything like a bargain. The central bank is, it can't be pushed around. Um, so if the central bank is independent and it can control inflation, just exactly why should I worry about pushing out arbitrary amounts of debt? The debt, you might say, well, maybe nobody will buy the debt. But the rate at which the debt trades for real goods is the price level. So if we're absolutely confident that the central bank can control the price level, why should anybody hesitate to buy dollar-denominated government debt? The central bank is there keeping the value of that debt as it matures at uh, its target of 2% or less per year. Um, so if you really accept that, if you have that simple view of the world, the central bank all by itself controls inflation, and we're confident that it's committed to controlling inflation, why should the fiscal authority worry about debt? Uh, the amount of debt at all. To understand the fallacy of that, you have to recognize that, the cent as we've discussed, the central bank can't necessarily control inflation if fiscal policy doesn't respond properly to monetary uh, tightening or loosening, for that matter. Um, so this is the left-wing version of Cheney. Uh, it's called Modern Monetary Theory. You may have seen it on the, on the internet. Uh, it's, it's hard to discuss it because actually they proudly do not base their policy prescriptions on an internally consistent model. That's neoclassical economics. Um, but they, but it, it involves some of the same insights that I've been putting forward, there are three things they assert that are actually true. One is that a currency that issues, that a country that issues own currency nominal debt can always finance spending by issuing new debt. 
at least so long as everybody's confident they can run positive primary surpluses in the future. If they're, if they're slack in the economy, so you don't really have full employment or full usage of resources, then debt finance might not be inflationary. They would, probably wouldn't be inflationary. They do, you don't see this point three in every exposition of modern monetary theory. Sometimes they leave three out, but the, the more rational amongst the modern monetary theorists do include three as at least a footnote. Inflation could happen if we get full resources, usage of resources, but if it does, we know the appropriate instrument to control inflation, it's taxes. We can tax and that'll stop the inflation. Um, so these assertions together become a rationale for saying we should not hesitate to undertake big new spending programs, infrastructure, free college education for all, um, single payer med medical care, um, we don't, we shouldn't be inhibited by, by worries about government debt in undertaking these big initiatives. And I actually, my own view is that our public sector is too small. I'd like to see a bigger role in government, uh, in, in, for government in medical care. I'd like to see, um, uh, I don't think we need to drastically cut Social Security, and I think we tax ourselves too little. But despite agreeing with that, I recognize what's missing in this theory, which is that the amount of taxation you have to do to control inflation is connected to how much debt you issued to finance your spending. And there, the modern monetary theory puts these three propositions together, mentions you may have to tax to stop inflation at some point, doesn't bring out the fact that how much you're going to have to tax is strongly related to how much debt you issued. Because once you recognize that, you realize that debt issue is a way to postpone taxes, not to eliminate the need for taxes. Um, and then you have to start asking, um, how do we get political support for our, for our uh, plans to expand government, the government role? when we recognize that we're going to have to pay for it. The U.S. is at least a bit away from the zero lower bound on interest rates now. The European, the euro area and Japan are not. They have still negative interest rates. Um, the, um, so uh, at the zero lower bound, monetary policy becomes essentially impotent. Um, there are estimates, people in the Federal Reserve System like to believe that the big balance sheet changes that they made in response to the recession had an effect, so they've tried to estimate these things. Um, but the, the estimates, which uh, sometimes suggest that the, the balance sheet expansion May, may have changed long rates by on the order of 50 basis points, that is half a percent. Um, this is nothing like the strength of, of the, the size of the changes in interest rates that were done in the 70s, for example, in response to big recessions. There, there you got 200, 300 basis points moves, moves in interest rates in response to cyclical um, uh, shocks. And I think we would have seen that if there weren't a zero lower bound in effect in, in response to the 2008-9 recession, we would have had far bigger reductions in interest rates. <clears throat> but you couldn't do it because you can't charge um, more than slightly negative interest rates when currency, which pays zero rates, is available as, as an alternative. <clears throat> so, um, uh, the, the, what is still available as a policy instrument is fiscal expansion. Fiscal expansion 
in order to increase aggregate demand, in order to push inflation back up towards its target, in Japan and the Euro, and the Euro area, inflation has been lower th than the nominal central bank target for a long time, um, and they don't seem to have been able to figure out how to get it back up. You could get it back up if you could undertake an unbacked fiscal expansion. That is, you have to tell people, we're running deficits now, and we're not going to pay for this with taxes. The plan is our inflation is too low. We're running these deficits to get inflation back up to where we want it to be. Um, it's very difficult to get politicians to agree to announcing such a strategy. I had a lot of conversations with Japanese politicians a year ago. Um, they are quite aware of the fact that monetary policy is impotent, that they've had interest rates at zero or lower, and it hasn't succeeded in making their economy hot. Um, but they're also aware that their economy is full of old people who have deposits in, uh, in the postal saving system uh, that they're relying on for retirement. And they don't want to announce that their plan is to pay off their debt in good part through higher inflation rates because pensioners are not going to like that. And actually, the party in power is heavily supported by pensioners. <clears throat> um, so it can be difficult to arrange this. And in fact, if you look at what the euro area did, it's even worse. They went into recession because of defaults in Greece, and because there's no central fiscal authority, the southern tier countries were forced into fiscal contraction at the same time they were heading into um, um, severe recession. Um, and so it was the very opposite of unbacked fiscal expansion. Uh, I've talked a little bit about Europe and Japan, so let me conclude so we have some time for question <coughs> Q&A. Um, so the, the basic messages here are there are advantages for a country to have a substantial amount of widely traded government debt denominated in its own currency. Um, but this is in their tax, these are tax smoothing advantages. Um, inflation and deflation are fundamentally always connected to fiscal policy. I, I, this is a, a paraphrase of a, of a slogan of Milton Friedman who said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, this says inflation and deflation are always and everywhere fiscal phenomena. And both, this is a definition of a deep truth. The thing and its opposite are both true. Um, they, it, is, it is true that very high inflations um, have always involved rapid expansion of the money, money supply, but they've also always involved big budget deficits that um, were with, with an attempt to finance part of them with, with um, ex rapid expansions of the money supply. I haven't talked at all about what happens, what the interaction between demand for money and demand for government debt is. That's a whole separate technical set of issues, um, which you can get into if you read some of the literature. And then finally, um, institutional devices like independence of the central bank that are, and, and in, independence in the sense of lack of communication of central banks and fiscal authorities, um, they, they are created to control inflation, but they can be dangerous if they give the illusion that they can disconnect inflation from fiscal fundamentals. So that's it. Quick question regarding the uh, independent bank. Would we be better off without it? Would we be better off turning it all over to our Treasury Department? Um, I don't think we're at that point yet. <laughs> there, there are advantages to, in normal times, to keeping uh, monetary policy independent. Early in our country's history, monetary policy was at the center of partisan political discussions. The farmers wanted low interest rates. The East Coast businessmen wanted high interest rates. Um, and we got rid of that. Um, and that's 
basically a plus. The problem, the, uh, the problem is at, the, uh, the recent problem has been at the zero lower bound where, um, where the notion that independence, an independent central bank can always control inflation becomes dangerous. That is, that is, it can get inflation up to target. In fact, it's, um, this is something that central bankers worry about. They, worry all, they always worry about credibility. Volcker gave credibility to the central banks as to their ability to stop inflation when it started getting high. But we're at the z when you're at the zero lower bound, what you need is credibility to the central bank's inflation target from above, that they can get inflation up to where they can stop zero or negative inflation and get it up to the 2% that's the target. Um, and since they can't do it without fiscal support, it undermines their credibility if everybody assumes that it's simply there, they don't know how to do it. So their, their problems, it's not, the problems are not with in, independence of the central bank, the problems are with, with how that's interpreted. The central bank ought to be, um, most of the time, making decisions about controlling it, be, be charged with controlling inflation and making decisions about interest rates to control inflation without having to consult or talk to the legislature. But when we get to in recession and at the zero lower bound, uh, the central bank should be talking, telling the fiscal authorities, we can't do this by ourselves. This is a time when we need fiscal expansion. There's a lot of sympathy for that within central bank research staff, but it's, um, but be precisely because central bankers are worried about the possible fragility of their independence, they don't like to talk about fiscal policy at all. And so my view is they, sh they should recognize that when they get a down to the zero lower bound, it's part of their job to point out as the custodians of the inflation rate that they now need some support from the fiscal side. So connecting to your quote about Reagan by Dick Cheney and the theme that there's a disconnect between what politicians say and what the economic data shows, uh, if you were in a political debate, uh, a presidential political debate, and you had one candidate who was the typical pro-Reaganomics and one candidate who was today's typical against Reaganomics, and you were the third candidate, and you had three minutes to talk in the audience, <laughs> and, the, and the audience is uh, the, your typical American citizen. It's televised across the United States. You have three minutes. What would your answer be to dismantle both uh, of their theories and policies? I've taken 60 minutes and you still don't understand what I was saying. <laughs> um, the, um, I don't think you can do it in, in three minutes. And furthermore, um, you know, I don't know what Reaganomics is exactly. Uh, at, at one point, you know, um, the, uh, David Stockman, one of the first staff members, was very upset when he realized that, that the group he was coming in with um, seemed to be paying no attention to the deficit, and he thought that they had been elected to pay a lot of attention to the deficit. Um, the, um, um, so I don't think there's any, um, there's any three minute answer as to what uh, right monetary and fiscal policy are. Um, there are a lot of issues um, that, that are that don't fit under the simple deficit tax expense framework that I've been talking about. Uh, one example that's interesting um, is this last tax cut we had was heavily targeted towards reducing capital tax rates. In economic theory, some economists have the idea that economic theory tells us capital tax rates should be zero. But the theoretical papers on this subject actually say capital taxes should be very high now and be understood to be going to zero 
soon in the future. Well, what have we done not in, with the last tax cut? We cut capital taxes at a time of prosperity. At some point, the Democrats are going to come back in power. They're going to need revenue. Their constituents are not corporate America. Those capital taxes are probably going to come back up. That's the worst kind of fiscal policy capital taxes that are low now and high in the future. The, the reason it's good to have capital taxes high now and low in the future is that the capital taxes high now are taxing returns on investment that's already been made and can't be undone. So it doesn't produce much distortion. By saying taxes are going to be low in the future, you encourage investment, which is going to pay off in the future. If you do the reverse, you cut taxes now and make people think, well, they're going to have to raise them again in the future. You're hurting current investment and producing a windfall for people who own the own the owned capital. So that's an example that you can argue was bad policy. It doesn't really have anything to do directly with the size of the, de the deficit. It just has to do with the political economy. Um, I think that people who want lower capital taxation should have recognized that this was not the way to do it as a permanent solution as a highly partisan uh, measure that looks likely to be at least partially re reversed sometime in the future. That was a little longer than three minutes. Yes. <laughs> I, that's what I said. I can't do it in three minutes. Um, I was curious, have you studied um, foreign direct investments in real estate along with some of those limits if you either cannot lower taxes anymore or either um, as a confidence for the primary surplus um, in relation to the, the expectations if they are as low confidence or higher confidence, does that affect the rate that you have foreign direct investment in our property versus our corporate debt, our, um, our, our debt as a currency? Thank you. That gets into the weeds more than I usually do. For, so you're asking whether uh, how the the how the relative amounts of foreign and direct investment into property versus government debt might be affected um, by fiscal policy. I think that's a very complicated question, because returns to property are going to depend on what's going on in the economy, um, and so and these the fiscal policy options I've been talking about are options that are going to raise economic growth or lower it. Those things are going to going to have, have direct effects on, on returns to real estate. Uh, so I, don't, I think there's not a simple answer to whether you expect changes in fiscal policy to systematically shift demand from, from government debt to real estate or vice versa. since no one's at the microphone. Um, what about the different methods of taxation? Is there a ratio to show maybe some of the effects between corporate debt, um, you know, again, property taxes, or um, currency issuing the different rates of currency debt? Yeah, that's another set of very interesting questions that, that I, I haven't dealt with. Um, the, um, are they, uh, the good part of the recent tax reform was um, aimed at reducing reliance on corporate profit taxes. Corporate profit taxes end up with double taxation of, of capital. Um, and there's an argument that you'd like to get rid of that. Um, property taxes are distorting, um, though Depending on the type of property taxes, you can argue that they're less distorting than other taxes. It's, so if you're really trying to do serious fiscal policy, you have to think about what kinds of taxes you're changing. Um, the degree of distortions you and the importance of the distortions you create are different for every kind of tax. And that gets beyond what I'm trying to do in this lecture. I'm curious if uh, the structural issues of our demographics and health care are fully factored into your models. The, it was announced yesterday by Biogen that their, their leading drug for Alzheimer's failed and, and they lost 30% of their value. 
and it was the great kind of hope for that field. And it's estimated by the Alzheimer's Association that in the next 30 years from now, 2050, 1.2 the, the, the annual cost to our economy would be $1.2 trillion a year and cumulatively $20 trillion a year, so almost equal to our federal debt. And I'm not sure that our politicians are talking about it or, and the Federal Reserve can't do anything about it, but is, is that in your model? Um, the, the models underlying this are all about um, explicit marketable debt and the connection between the marketable debt and returns to that marketable debt. Uh, but, of course, there's what you're talking about are implicit obligations that we have. Uh, we don't expect that Medicare for people with Alzheimer's will be eliminated because it's too expensive. Um, but it will be expensive, and the question is, how are we going to fund that? Um, the, um, so it's in the background of my discussion of these models. When I, when I talked about the hyper-Ricardian uh, expectations about deficits, that was in the background. That is, the fact that, that our aging population realizes that there are going to be problems in the future and that nobody yet is really talking about how to resolve those, or at least there's no political consensus as to how to resolve those. Um, and that's what makes people pessimistic about uh, when they plot out the effects on future primary surpluses of, of a current deficit. So when you look at the current deficit at a time of prosperity and you realize that somehow we're going to probably have to raise a lot more revenue in the future, um, the question is where is that going to come from? And certainly the last policy initiative and in fiscal policy gave no indication of where it's going to come from. The, the, the current um, administration budget talks about cuts in Medicare, cuts in uh, Social Security, um, but nobody expects that it's a realistic, politically realistic um, program. Um, and I think it's that, that um, even the voters for Trump didn't think that it was part of the, his program. He said he was not going to cut Medicare. Um, so people who voted for him didn't think they were voting for extreme stringency on um, future entitlements. And I, don't, I think it's very hard to run on a pro platform of sharply reducing future entitle entitlements and win. <laughs> uh, but either the entitlements have to be reduced or taxes have to be raised. And it's hard to run on a, t on a, on a platform of increasing taxes and win. So. Um, it's, we haven't had a situation like this historically. It's not clear how this gets resolved in a democratic country. So it's, there's uncertainty there. I just have a comment and a question, yes. Comment is, you're talking about personal taxes. How about corporate taxes? They are the people who are not really paying taxes because they have operations elsewhere, not in the U.S. Can, can you suggest ways of uh, eliminating that? That way we don't have this tax burden? That's actually a complicated question. The, the question is related to how um, corporations who have operations in many countries are taxed. Um, that was another initial focus of discussion in the, in the last round of tax um, legislation, and there were some economists who had clever ideas about rationalizing um, uh, corporate taxation and how it treats taxes in different countries. But in the end, it wasn't really rationalized. Um, and we, uh, it is a, a very difficult question. Our current system creates incentives to realize corporate income in places with low taxes. Uh, and then it creates incentives for countries or jurisdictions to lower taxes in order to attract uh, corporate investment. Uh, and it's, um, it's a complicated mess. Capital taxation in general creates in, uh, difficulties because people try to sh shift income between different categories. I, I think 
the most prominent example is profits versus capital gains. There's lots of opportunities to turn flow profits into capital gains, which were taxed at a different and lower rate. And so long as we maintain that difference, differential in rates, we end up with people having incentives to um, organize their, their uh, business entities and their flows of revenue in ways that avoid taxation and that may be inefficient. So there's lots of room for making taxes more rational and more efficient, but it's very difficult to uh, get that kind of change through in Congress. It requires bipartisan dealing and tr some trust across the aisle, and we haven't had that for a while. 